Sounds True presents Music as Medicine, the Art and Science of Healing with Sound, with musician, composer, teacher, and author, Kay Gardner. And now, Music as Medicine, Session 1, Life is Vibration, with Kay Gardner. Everything vibrates, from the smallest molecule in our bodies to the universe itself. As long as anything is moving, it is vibrating. And as long as it is vibrating, it is making some kind of a sound. We may not perceive the sound because it may be lower than the threshold of our hearing or higher than the threshold of our hearing, but it is making a sound as long as it vibrates. Music is organized sound. Music has many elements that are healing. When I was a small child, I started reaching for the piano keys when I was about two years old. And my parents, fortunately, had enough income to be able to give me lessons starting when I was four. And I came from a musical home. My father and mother both sang. My mother played Chopin on the piano and Beethoven sonatas, so I always had music around, and I always knew I would be a musician. As far as music and healing, I didn't know that I was writing healing music until 1975 when I put my first album, Moon Circles, out. And I had written this album in order to heal myself. I'd come out of a difficult marriage, and I was very vulnerable at the time, and this music is what healed me. Well, when folks heard this, they said, this is such healing music. Well, I knew it healed me, but I had no idea that it could heal other people. I got very curious. What is it about music that makes it healing? And all of a sudden, I started getting pamphlets and books, and people started handing me things that I should know about because they knew I was interested in this, and the study began. I think the very first pamphlet was a small one by Manley Hall about the therapeutic value of music. So I came to this through my first album, through getting pamphlets and books about the subject of what makes music healing, and then I started doing workshops. And the very early workshops, all I did was have folks lie on the floor, and you could do this yourself right now. Wherever you are, take this tone into your body with your breath and start chanting on it. You could just hum the sound, or you could chant on the syllable ah. Whatever resonates the most in your body, whatever sound you need to make the body resonate or vibrate with the sound that I'm going to play. <laughs> Where do you feel that tone in your body? Now let me try another tone and see if you feel it in the same place. For most people, the two different tones are going to vibrate in different places in the body. And this is just to show you that we respond to sounds immediately. We feel them in our bodies. Vibrations touch us. The most healing instrument of all is your own voice, and that is what you're going to be able to feel the vibration most when you are chanting the sound with your own voice. In this course, we're going to go through nine elements of music and what each one can do for healing, for relaxation, 
The very first one is not a musical element at all. It is stating one's intent before one does any healing work. I like to say a nice non-denominational prayer, which would be, may the work that I do be used for the highest good. You may have a deity that you'd like to call upon for that. God, goddess, source, all that is, the force. There are many words for that healing center. That should begin all healing work as far as I'm concerned. Then we go into the actual musical elements, and those are drone, which is long, uninterrupted sounds. Probably you're most familiar with the bagpipe drone. To those of us in the West, that's the most familiar drone. Then we'll go into the more esoteric term, and that would be harmonics or overtones, and we will get to that soon. Then we'll go into repetition, chants, rounds. Different types of music have repetition in them. Rhythm. Rhythm is an extremely important element because it duplicates the pulse of the body, and we can do that musically. Then we get into harmony and melody, which are things we're all familiar with about music. Harmony is usually the chords underneath some kind of melody. Melody is the line, the singing part of music. Then we get into instrumental color, and that is, why does an oboe sound like an oboe? Why doesn't an oboe sound like a flute? Why would an oboe have a different effect on our bodies than a flute? We'll get into that as well. And then we'll finish with form, the shape that the music takes, the direction that the musical piece might take us in as we're listening to it. And then ending again with intent, because that is the most important word of all, I believe, in any healing modality the intent that you have when you are playing the music and when you are choosing the music. Have you ever thought of what life would be like without music? It's incomprehensible. Of course, I'm a musician, obviously. I would not be able to live without music, but the thought of not having music at all, that means no bird song, not just instruments, but not even birds. It would be horrible. We know that music affects us emotionally. When you're in a rotten mood, you can put on a piece of music that immediately touches you emotionally and lifts you spiritually. There's certain kinds of music that are very spiritually uplifting. But I'm curious, too, about how music touches the body itself. And in our earlier experiment, wherever you were chanting along with my flute, you felt that music touched your body. And I'd like to get into that more because all of these different elements, you'll notice how music touches your body as well as your spirit and your emotions and your mind. There's a real important law here, and that's called the law of octaves. And musicians know what octaves are. Some of you may not know what I'm talking about when I talk about octaves. So let me play you some octaves on the keyboard. Here's a very low tone. The tone with twice the vibrations of that tone is this one. This next tone has twice the vibrations as the one I just played and four times the vibration of the first one I played. And we can go up the keyboard, playing one octave after another. Here's another way to look at octaves. If I was to sing what is called solfege, that is going, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, here's a do, and I started with a do, and I ended with a do, and this first do we'll call one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Number eight and number one are both do. Only this do is twice the vibration of this do, and this do is half the vibration of this do. This do is eight tones above this do, which means in Latin it's an octave from the word for eight. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, each octave. is a multiple of the very first note that we heard. And this law exists in nature, and it exists in music. When a young child sings a nursery song, say, Mary had a little lamb, they'll go, Mary had a little lamb. Well, it may be too high for Dad to sing way up there, so he'll sing, Mary had a little lamb. Why does it work? If dad is singing the lower tone and the child is singing the higher tone, how do they get along? Because they're singing in parallel octaves to each other. And since octaves are all multiples of each other, vibrationally, then it works. Color is also comprised of octaves, octaves of sound, octaves distant from each other. If I played what is called a C in music, Vibrationally, if I were to translate that into color, and the color would be red, it would be 40 octaves above sound because color and light and sound vibrate on parallel wavelengths. But because light is seen and not felt like sound, it is 40 octaves higher than sound. So when you think I've just played a few octaves here, Well, count 30-some more octaves above that, and you get light or color. Everything travels on octaves, on parallel wavelengths. Even scent travels on a parallel wavelength with light and sound. And all of these things are related and correlated. Which brings us to chakras. Yogis and clairvoyants see chakras as they look at the human body as whirling vortices of light just outside the physical body. And each one of these whirling vortices of light is associated with a different energy center of the human body. The seven major chakras are the root chakra, the base of the spine. Again, these are energy centers not in the body but seen as whirling vortices of light just outside the body. The base of the spine, which is the root chakra. The belly chakra, which is about two finger breadths below the navel. The diaphragm, which is called the solar plexus chakra. The heart chakra in the center of the chest, the sternum area. The throat chakra. The third eye or brow chakra and the crown, the top of the head chakra. Native American teachers also see another chakra just below our feet, which is our connection with Mother Earth. And that's about a foot below where our feet are in contact with the Earth as we stand. And above our heads is another chakra called the transpersonal point. And when we are in deep psychic concentration or prayer, Yogis and clairvoyants can see a kind of a cone of light going up to that transpersonal point above our heads, like we're wearing a pointed hat of light, so that we're in prayer or psychic concentration. This is where our energy is going. So we are really light beings. We are seen as light. And there are different colors associated with the different chakras. And because the chakras whirl, there's also different sounds that are associated with the different chakras. In my work, I was very interested in what the physiological effects were on the areas of the body that corresponded with the chakras. I was interested in how sound touched us and if any colors came to mind as we were hearing those sounds because a lot of people experience sound as color. I don't particularly, and you may not, but some of you may. I'm going to play another tone on the flute and ask this time that not only do you chant along with it, but be aware as you're chanting if any colors come to mind or if a particular color comes to mind. Mm -hmm. 
keep chanting on that tone. And as you're chanting, be aware. Does any color come to mind? Some of you may even experience a scent when you're chanting on that particular tone. Good. Now, as I said earlier, according to the law of octaves, color travels on a parallel wavelength with sound. So for you to pick up a color while you're chanting with a sound is very normal, or even a scent. In fact, blind people are taught how to see color. Say someone wants to teach a blind person what the color orange is. Well, then literally the fruit orange would be held under that person's nose, and then they would know what orange was. And the same with the smell of a red rose. That smells, that perfumes and scents are just as powerful as color and sound and all relate to different chakras or energy centers of the body. The root chakra in many esoteric teachings is seen predominantly as red. The belly chakra is ascribed the color orange. The solar plexus, yellow. The heart, green, a spring green. If you can imagine meadows in springtime, that wonderful, pure, early spring green. The throat is seen as sky blue. The third eye as indigo. And the crown of the head as violet. This isn't to say that everyone's going to see them the same color, but over the years, many, many teachers have taught this particular progression of colors. And it is a rainbow progression. Some of the scents that travel along with the colors and the tones are the following. For red, patchouli, sandalwood, geranium, camphor. For orange or the belly chakra, the smell of vanilla. For the solar plexus chakra, the smell of citron, the smell of citrus or lemon. The heart chakra responds to the smell of jonquils or orange flowers. The throat chakra, lilacs, lily of the valley. The brow chakra or the third eye, new mown hay, a smell of lavender. The crown chakra, violets, peppermint, cinnamon. These are scents that travel along parallel wavelengths with color and sound. Now let's look deeper at the chakras. Each one has an attribute. The root chakra, the base of the spine, the one that relates to the color red, it's the center of passion. It's the center of physical and sexual energy. Every flag of revolution has red in it. It's passion. Why do you give your lover red roses? For passion. So there is the center of passion. The belly is the center of the emotions and feelings. The color orange is associated with the belly chakra. The solar plexus chakra which is in the diaphragm area, is related to the color yellow. And this is a center of vitality. It's also a center of psychic awareness in that when this chakra is open, and you might want to think of chakras as flowers. They open with the light, they close with the dark. Sometimes our chakras are wide open, sometimes they're really closed. They're receiving energy or they're not receiving energy. When we're doing healing work, we want the chakras to be wide open, but we do not want to be walking out in traffic with our chakras wide open because we are taking on too much. We're taking on too much energy. 
this solar plexus chakra is like a radio receiver. When it's wide open, it's taking on all kinds of input, all kinds of energy from everywhere. And so it's not really great to be walking around with our solar plexus chakra wide open all the time. It's a center of vitality, but it's very good to remember that when we overdo it with coffee or alcohol or any drugs whatsoever, that's making that center wide open. And you can consciously close that chakra, not clench it, but close it so it's not so wide open and receiving at that time. As I say, there's times for them to be open and there's times for them to be closed. Then we get to the heart chakra. This chakra responds to the color green, that wonderful spring green that we talked about. And it is the center of compassion and the center of healing. The throat chakra, the sky blue energy center, is the center of communication and creative expression. And it's very interesting how many people today have throat blocks. They're either not able to create, they're in a creative block like writers and artists, and they get terrible throat problems as a result, or they're not able to say who they are. Perhaps they're going through a difficulty in a relationship, and their throat will just clench right up. And so here is the center, the throat, the center of creative expression and communication. I thought it was interesting that a president recently, whenever he would speak, he was called the great communicator, and he will go nameless here, but they would have a bright blue background whenever he spoke. And I thought it was really interesting psychologically that whoever set up the stage for this great communicator to speak would set him up with this bright blue background because it was helping him get across what he had to say. Now we get to a more elusive color and the third eye, the indigo. You might think of indigo as the color of a brand new pair of blue jeans or the night sky at new moon. That's indigo. It's kind of a luminescent, slightly purplish, deep, deep blue. This is associated with the third eye chakra and this is the center of insight, intuition, and perception. So if you can remember, indigo, intuition, insight, and perception. And then the crown chakra, the one at the very top of your head, is related to bliss, the feeling of oneness with all that is, universal consciousness, and violet. So you see how each chakra rises from the physical, to the emotional, to the mental, to the spiritual. And chakras also respond to different vowels. And I find this very interesting. The root chakra responds to the syllable oo. The belly, o. Oh. The solar plexus, aw, a-w. This could be regional. You may pronounce a-w a different way than I do, but aw for the solar plexus. For the heart, ah, A-H, ah. For the throat, eh, E-H, eh. For the third eye, eh, good way to remember that. Insight, intuition, indigo, eh, the third eye. E for the very top of the head. Put all those vowels together, they don't spell mother, they spell the word why. This is just a way of remembering them in order. Oo, o, a, a, e, e. Why? How handy to have an English word to help us remember that progression of vowels. Each one of those vowels is very powerful. In ancient cultures, the deity was called upon by different combinations of vowels, whatever deity. In Hebrew teaching, it's Yahweh. Those are all vowels, so vowels are very holy and very sacred and associated with the chakras. There's also gemstones that are associated with the chakras. There are spinal points that are associated with the different chakras. Again, visualize the chakras as flowers. You might even visualize the flowers as having a funnel that funnels in to the physical body at these particular points. And when they funnel into the body, 
the place where they touch us is in our endocrine glands. Endocrine glands are the glands that have no ducts, D-U-C-T-S, ducts, leading to or from them. They secrete on their own. And what do they secrete? They secrete hormones. And each one of these glands is also associated with the chakra system. And you'll notice how these endocrine glands relate to the different attributes that I just gave you. The root chakra, the ovaries, and the gonads, or the glands of sexuality. The belly chakra relates to the spleen or the adrenals. The spleen in Chinese medicine is the organ of courage. And we were talking about the second chakra being the center of emotions and feelings. The adrenal glands, you've heard of the flight or fight syndrome, where perhaps someone gets pinned under a car and someone gets superhuman strength and is able to lift that car right off of them. That is because of adrenaline, which is the hormone that is associated with the second chakra, the belly. And then we get into the pancreas area for the solar plexus. The pancreas secretes insulin. The thymus gland, now here's one I think we should spend more time on because right now in these times we're having a lot of autoimmune disease. And the thymus is the center of the immune system. The spleen is also a center, but the thymus is the main center of the autoimmune system. And the thymus is a little heart-shaped gland. Our hearts are not heart-shaped. The thymus gland is, when we use the term light-hearted, or hard-hearted, or cold-hearted. We're not talking about the blood-pumping organ. We're talking about the thymus gland. Because you know when you have joy in your heart, it's not in the pumping organ. It's in the center of your chest. There's just an openness. And this is the gland that is associated with the heart chakra. This is the gland where the flower that is the chakra funnels into the physical body. And a lot of alternative healers will say, Thump your thymus. You take your fist and just thump on the sternum, which is where it is in the center of your chest. Maybe you could put your hand up to your chin, and where your thumb falls to the left of your sternum is where your thymus is located. There's almost a little indentation there. This little heart-shaped gland secretes the hormone that begins to deal with any kind of deficiency in the body. It is a healing center. Where your Adam's apple might be, you'll have a gland called the thyroid gland, and that means shield in Greek. Thyroid comes from the word meaning shield. And then there's four little points, two on either side of your throat, that are called the parathyroid glands. And these glands are associated with the throat chakra. When we get to the third eye, we get to the pituitary gland. That particular gland is kind of in charge of all the other endocrine glands. The endocrine system is really quite fascinating. These ductless glands secreting hormones. In the last century, they called hormones humors. So it has a lot to do with mood. And you'll see the tie-in with the attributes that we talked about earlier. So there we are at the pituitary gland, which is located just behind your third eye, which is at the brow, just above where your eyebrows meet, is that third eye, that center of insight. And the final chakra that's within the body is the pineal gland. Some people pronounce it pineal, I think, but it's pineal, and you might think of it easier pronouncing it that way because it's the shape of a little pine cone. And it's just behind the pituitary gland. And this is the gland that is in charge of light. People who are depressed a lot in the wintertime have something that scientists have called seasonal affective disorder, which is sad. And one way that they are treating this, because the pineal only secretes its hormone at night when there is no light. People with sad have too much of that hormone. And in order to have the pineal gland not secrete so much, They have people getting up early in the morning and sit in front of banks of full-spectrum light. And that way, 
they're not secreting the hormone and that's not making them so depressed. Another way would be to move to Florida or Mexico or someplace that's very, very sunny and spend your winters there. I wrote a piece of music a while back called A Rainbow Path, and each segment of the music related to a particular chakra. At the same time as I was creating the music, my friend Gina Halpern, no relation to the musician Stephen, Gina was painting mandalas, or circular meditational art, to go with each one of the pieces of music that I was creating. And when she got to the piece for the throat chakra, she started painting. She was painting in blue, and she had an altar set up for each one of the colors, and she lived in that color as she was painting it, and she wore those colors as she was painting the mandala. When she got to the one for the throat, the blue one, she got this terrible sore throat. It was just awful. She called this disease monochromy, which was too much of one color. And what she figured out that she needed to do in order to balance it out was to use the color that was the opposite of blue on the color wheel. And that color was a kind of a peach color. And as long as she put a little peach or kind of color of flame in with the blue, then she would not get this monochromy or too much of one color. So every one of the colors that we're talking about has an opposite on the color wheel, and that opposite brings balance into it. Now, musically, there's another way to bring balance, and that is by playing the fifth. Now, you non-musicians may not know what I'm talking about, but let me play a tone and show you what I mean by what a fifth is. Here's the tone that most electricity hums at in our homes. We're not really aware of that sound, but it's humming all the time. And you might notice that when there's a power outage, when the power comes back on, how wonderfully silent it was when there was no electricity. That hum is humming in our walls all the time. So we live with that at all times, this sound. Now, if you have a fluorescent light or a refrigerator that's humming loudly on that tone, it can be very obnoxious. And there's a way to balance it out. Just as when Gina was getting monochromy from too much blue, she was able to balance it out and not be bothered by using the opposite color on the color wheel. In music, we count up five tones from whatever the obnoxious tone is. Here's the obnoxious tone again. I use that as number one. One, two, three, four, five. If I take the five, which in music we call the fifth, and combine it with the sound that is not good, I will get this. Listen to the difference of just hearing the one tone, and adding the fifth, what happens? So you see, when the tone is played by itself, how obnoxious it is, but when the fifth is added to it, it balances it out. So if you have an obnoxious sound in your environment, identify where that sound is, sing it, and count up five tones and sing that fifth. Your own voice is much more powerful than any other source of sound. If you can sing the fifth above that obnoxious sound, then you're going to be able to balance it. This concludes session one. Please turn the tape over for session two. <laughs>